and I feel very humble to be amongst you um, and somewhat um, <laughs> out of my depth really um, to, be, to be amongst such illustrious company and it in, in a way answers the third question why we must and why we do want to and why we will continue to work with religious leaders in this movement to end violence against children. UNICEF, I'm the representative for UNICEF, but I, I, I have so little mana compared to my, my compatriots here. This is, this is why we must work together. Uh, the influence that, that you have in your communities amongst your people uh, is, 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 is so critical to changing, developing, enhancing the positive behaviours and changing those, those norms that allow people that know these children, as Professor Gunasekara said, this violence is perpetrated on children by people, largely by people they know, people they trust. So working with religious leaders is, is, the, is, is part of the antidote to them, those that are trusted to work positively uh, to promote the very many good practices that children need and the support that they need from adults to develop. But let me get back to the first part of the question. What are our priorities? Our priorities are to work with you um, and, and, and to find ways to work with the community, the government, civil society, religious leaders to end violence. What does that mean? We know that violence against children occurs mostly in settings that are very familiar to the child such as the family of the school, and that the violence against children is perpetrated in the overwhelming majority of cases by people that they know <clears throat> and perhaps trust. We need to combat physical punishment and emotional abuse and verbal abuse, especially associated with disciplining children and sexual violence. We must and are investing in interventions that will also make the all-pervasive online environment safer for children. These changes are vital, however, they cannot be achieved by us alone, <laughs> or even by us at all. We, our role as an international organisation is to work with local people bringing the best ideas from around the world, stimulating the discussion and helping to bring resources to bear to support you, uh, our partners, colleagues in this. We, all citizens, civil society, religious organisations, government, we all need to work together. That's why the National Partnership to End Violence Against Children which the government of Sri Lanka has, has taken on and launched is so important in that it brings and will continue to bring all these actors together and it's great that Professor Gunasekara is a leading advocate in that. So what are some of the important nexuses or gaps? Corporal punishment, I think we've already talked about this, this uh, it's, it's prevalent and it's culturally accepted in Sri Lanka and is closely linked to disciplining children. Some of you will remember that just within the last 12 months or so, um, prominent leaders in Sri Lanka have voiced some form of support for this in schools. And really, I know these attitudes are changing, norms change, and we have to accelerate that. But this, is, it is totally unacceptable. And the good news is that norms do change. In my country, when I was at school more years ago than I care to admit, I was caned for ridiculous things. Um, but now that cannot happen in New Zealand, and it does not happen in New Zealand. So norms change, and we need to we need to take heart in that and accelerate that process. And, and this, 
norm is pervasive. It is hitting, how can hitting a child do good for a child? <laughs> Does hitting me, hitting you, do any good to you? I, this, is, this is ridiculous. We just have to work to change the, these norms. And we need to bring social pressure to bear. Social pressure, legal pressure, legal remedies to bear on the perpetrators to change this abusive behaviour. And while there are laws on cruelty to children, there is no specific law against corporal punishment yet. And I know regulations have been passed, but this is, so we need to be working at all these different levels, changing norms, but we really need to get the legislation in line. And I know I attended the pre-sessional meeting for Sri Lanka at the CRC committee in, in, in June, and I know this is going to be a subject of some discussion at the, at the uh, dialogue with Sri Lanka in January. Um, and most importantly of all, well, not most importantly of all, but importantly, thanks, violence begets violence. It is a cycle. If, you, uh, it, it, if, we sh if we establish the norm for our children that it's okay to be hit, and this is something that's positive, then this continues. It's intergenerational. So we have to break that. So coming back to the question of why are religious leaders so important? Uh, it's, it's, it's blaringly obvious. The leaders of all religions command great respect among their people, their communities, and influence thinking, foster dialogue, and set priorities for their communities and are able to influence policy makers and legislatures. Religious leaders are also extraordinary teachers, advocates, informal leaders, and counselors in the communities they serve. They have close opportunities to interact directly with parents and children through their work in the community, including directly, as you talked about, with the Sunday schools um, and other, other means. Their sermons are often broadcast, so their words reach way beyond their, their own communities, their own temples, their own mosques, their own churches. We need to work more with religious leaders to end violence against children in Sri Lanka. We need to work together to advocate for the, provision, for the prohibition of physical and humiliating punishment in all settings. We need to promote positive parenting, positive parenting, and non-violent forms of discipline. We need to use teachings from religious texts and emphasize the protection of children through their worship services and religious education, such as you did just before with the story about Jesus putting the child at the center. And, of course, religious institutions also need to change and need to be the torchbearers. Um, as you mentioned, the scandals involving churches around the world, churches need to be the shining light in this and lead by example. Thank you very much. Thank you.